Amen. Praise forever to the King of Kings. God, you're so good. You're so worthy. We worship you this morning. And God, as we sing these songs out, it, it prepares our heart, God, to hear your word. And so with open hearts, God, humble spirits, we come before you this morning and say, speak to us, Spirit of God. Speak to us through your timeless truth so that we might be, our, our, our soul might be fed by you, God, and strengthened, nourished by you, Lord. Um, we're not lacking in anything because, uh, because God, we're, we're people of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. It says here, since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, here's the command, fervently love one another from the heart. Here's a point I want to make that might hit you a little strange, but we'll unpack it. Your heart is leading your soul. Your heart is leading your soul. You might think, huh? Heart and soul? I, what, is, what, is, what are you talking about? How, how do I even know the difference between the two? Some of you are already singing heart and soul from the piano, and you need to stop because that's going to distract you. I, <laughs> but let me say this. Your, your heart is leading you to the fridge a lot of times. Right? Because you're like, oh man, I'm not even hungry, but it would just be so good for a little bite of whatever's left in there, right? Your heart is leading you to certain relationships because you know they satisfy you. Your heart is leading you to make certain decisions in life for better or worse. Your heart is actually leading your soul. And these two words, these ideas are extremely connected in Scripture. You actually see Jesus say, love God with all your heart, all your soul, your mind, and in some verses, strength. When you put that whole thing together, essentially what he's saying is, love God with the whole person that he's given you. Love him with everything. Well, let's break it down a little bit. I just want to focus on the heart and soul. Heart would be like the, the center of your inner person. Now, inner person is your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, all of that inner working that's going on. So the heart would be the center of that inner person. The soul, then, would be the entire inner person. You see how closely connected they are? They're, they're almost like, you can't separate them. They've got to go together, which, which is the same thing, really. You could make the same argument for our body and our inner person, right? Our body and our soul. You can make the same argument that they're so closely connected that you almost can't separate them. There's a distinction there for sure, but they affect and impact each other because they're so closely working together. It's the way that God designed you. When he made you in his image, it's it's incredible. You marvel at it, right? We see it in little ways how, how our soul impacts our body. And you can say your mind and your heart, all that impacts your body. Every time you send an emoji, right? You're trying to give a physical expression about how you feel in that moment. This word's not going to do it. This word, if I say this sarcastic joke with that little wink emoji, they're going to think I'm mad, but I'm not. The little wink's supposed to tell you, hee hee, just kidding. So the heart is the center of the inner person. The soul is the complete inner person. The soul would be like the engine, the heart would be like the driver. The soul is like the engine. The heart is like the driver. The engine's giving it power. The driver's saying, here's where you're going with this power. I want to talk about this morning unleashing your heart toward God. You can see the ramifications of that statement, right? Unleashing your heart towards God. The very driver of your life, who's deciding where your life is going, pointing that thing in the direction of God. 
So verse 22, the goal is explicit here. Peter says, okay, here's what I want you to do. The command is to fervently love one another from the heart. From the heart. We get these mixed messages about the heart from, from places. The culture, I'm just going to throw them under the bus a little bit. I'm not saying anything negative about it necessarily, but uh, you might have heard of this thing called Disney Plus, right? <laughs> Uh, the formula for Disney Plus movies is let's take this person against this villain and let's find out what happens when they're restrained by authorities and say, you know what? Just unleash your heart. Follow your heart. Go after your heart's desire and see what happens. And of course, they always break out from under authority and they run full on into their desires. And, and of course, they win <laughs> every time, right? Right? They find the prince or they defeat the foe or whatever happens. That's pretty much Disney Plus formula. I'm going to save you a lot of hours from watching Disney Plus right there. <laughs> Follow your heart. That's what you hear a lot in our culture. There is some truth to that. It's not all bad. But I think in the church, sometimes we do disservice to people because we, we cherry pick these verses and we say, no, 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 no. Don't trust your heart. Don't trust your heart at all. So then what, in, what we end up doing is we, we as people, we say, well, I have this faith in God, but my heart wants to go to this other thing over here. The verse I was talking about that we oftentimes cherry pick for that is Jeremiah 17, 9, and you're probably familiar with it. The heart is deceitful above all else. It's desperately sick or wicked. Who can know the darn thing? <laughs> Right? One minute, it's like, you know what I need? A salad. No, 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 no. Pizza. Right? It's just so quickly, like whatever. It, it, hey, if, if, I, if I wake up one day and I'm feeling really good, my heart's like, yes, Jesus. The next day I wake up on the wrong end of the bed, I'm like, not today. It can be so easily swayed. Do I need a nap? Am I hungry? Did somebody make me angry? It all directs my feelings. So I get it. Yes, the heart is deceitful. It'll send us down pitfalls because all, all because of the fact that you just needed a nap. <laughs> That's what you needed. Maybe you just need to go get some rest and think it over before you do that thing. Maybe you did need to eat, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know, but the heart is just so swayed and it'll sway your whole life. So Disney or the culture will stop picking on Walt, all right, for a moment. Follow your heart. The church sometimes says, reject it, don't trust it. Which message should we listen to? It's a bit of a dilemma. I, I think what Jeremiah, the wise prophet from the Old Testament, if we zoom out in his, in his book, was trying to do is for the first half, he said, yes, your heart is sick. It's like a desperate gambler. It'll let it all ride on black in Vegas. And if you follow it, you'll end up crawling to your hotel room at 3 a.m. shirtless, wondering where next month's rent's gonna come from. That's your heart. It's just like, let's just let it all go for anything in front of me. But then halfway through his book, in Jeremiah 24, 7, he says, God says to his people, I will give them a heart to know me. I'm the Lord. They're my people. I'll be their God, and they will return to me wholeheartedly. Don't you love that? The gospel says, yes, your heart is sick. Don't trust it. But it also says that there's one who can heal it and direct it and make it good so that your heart's responding to truth and not lies. There's so many implications for our life for that very one thing if we would trust it. Jesus can heal your heart. Do you believe it? Amen. Yeah. This last week, I got a text, and I was, she allowed me to share this, but from Mary over here. And she had under, undergone some procedures, and she was struggling with cancer, and they, they were thinking maybe they got it, and, and, but they said, you know, let's, let's, we need to follow up with some scans. And so they did a, a PET scan and a, and a bone scan, and, and she, she called us over 
couple of pastors and wives and said, hey, would you just pray for me in this? And we prayed over her and we got this real sense in the room that God's taking care of it. I, I mean, we, we didn't feel anything necessarily, but just this sense of like, you're healed, you're good, you're set. God's got you, he's healed you. And she came back with the result saying, zero cancer in her body. Praise God. Praise God. God is an amazing healer. If we would unleash our heart towards God, he would heal it. And I know some of you guys are saying like, okay, I get it, I get it. But I wonder, Monday through Saturday, are you positioning yourself in such a way that you're unleashing your heart toward God. So you say, all my desires, all my feelings, all my emotions, thoughts, Lord, I want them to come under your power so that you take me to places beyond what I can even imagine. God can do this. And you're going to see a little bit in a little bit how that kind of takes the faith of a child. So again, the Bible is saying, don't follow your heart. You'll be like a puppy if you do that. You're going to want to lick everyone and chase anything. <laughs> Let that one sit for a little bit. <laughs> if your mind took that too far, your heart needs to be healed. <laughs> Heal, puppy. The Bible also says, don't flat out reject your heart. And that kind of comes as news to some of us. Like, Christianity should be the most fulfilling, life-giving, I don't need this stuff of the world, why? Not because I'm saying no to something I really want, because I'm saying yes to something I want even more. That's Jesus. He frees us. He says, I want to give you life fully, so your heart is full. Proverbs 4, 23 says, everything, everything you do flows from your heart. That crazy? Isn't that crazy? Everything you do flows from your heart. And it goes on to say, so you better guard that thing above all else. Here's what 1 Peter is saying to us in verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. It's saying, obey the truth. You'll purify your soul that way. You'll end up with fervent love from the heart. Let's talk just for a moment about obeying the truth. The Greek word for truth in this passage points us to this, this picture of the greatest latitude. You might think, well, okay, well, that doesn't mean much to me. What it's saying is, as far north as you can go. John chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the truth. So if you want to know what to obey, it's Jesus. Why? Because he's true north. He's as far north as you can go. That's truth. He is the truth. He's the embodiment of it. He came down from heaven to reveal what truth looks like. If you want to know what God would do when he came to earth, it's Jesus. And he's incredible. Like, just read through the Gospels and allow your spirit to be challenged by them. Because when you read through them, you read about a guy that you, you've never quite met before but you want to get to know more. He's that good. It was even Gandhi who said, I don't even have a problem with Jesus. It's his Christians I have a problem with. I, I, I've, I've, I mean, some people are bitter, but I, I, I very rarely meet somebody who has a problem with Jesus. It, it, it's, it's us trying to follow, obey this truth, align ourselves with the person and the words of Jesus Christ that then purifies our soul so we can be made more like him. And when you talk about purifying your soul, again, remember, it's the engine. It's the engine inside of you that's driving your, your, your thoughts and your emotions and feelings and all decisions and all that. This is huge. I would challenge you to read and pray through Psalm 51. If you're like, man, I, I need my soul to get cleansed. I need just a good soul washing Psalm 51 is great for that. Verse two, the psalmist cries out to God and says, wash me thoroughly, God. Cleanse me from my sin. Verse 10, he says, create in me a clean heart. Oh God. 
I remember uh, leading someone to Jesus one time, and uh, they confessed Jesus as Lord. They said, you're in charge of my life now. They said, I, I'm making a commitment to turn from my way of living to please God. Praise God. Well, well let's, let's do that. Let's make a decision. So they did. They, they gave their life to Jesus. And then as I like to make a practice of it, pray over them after they do that, that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I, I won't forget what this guy said to me. After we, he confessed, made a decision, and we prayed together, he told me, I feel clean. And that struck me. This is, a, this is a guy who was weighed down by the sin in his life, had an encounter with the living God, and says, I feel clean. I'll tell you right now, in the shade, I feel cold. <laughs> I don't want to be distracted either. All right. I feel clean. Praise God. Isn't that a good feeling? How many people took a shower this morning? You can raise your hand if you want. <laughs> The reason why you did. Feels good to be clean. Feels good to be clean. How much better from the inside out to live a clean life? To be right with God. To wake up and say, he's not mad at me. I'm at peace with God. He loves me. He's singing over me. He's cleaned me. I don't deserve it. I made mistakes. But I have a place to go to get clean. Obey the truth Follow the true north, Jesus, purify your soul. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 22, the eye, which oftentimes we say is the window to the soul, the eye of the lamp of the, is, a, this is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. We got to catch that for a moment. That, what, what he's saying there is, is if, you're, if your soul is clean, people will see it in you. They'll see it. There's light in this person. I just get it. You know, whether you're a Christian or not, you can get a sense about somebody, right? You can just kind of, this is a, this is not such a good person. You just kind of get that discernment. Something's rubbing me the wrong way. Or you say, I don't know, there's something about this person. They seem really trustworthy. You could just, you could just kind of, and Jesus is saying the same thing. Obey the truth. What it ends up doing is purifying you from the inside out. You get a clean soul. And then you'll end up fervently loving people. The Greek word for fervent there is intense. Stretched out. Worked out. Um, I know, like, for, my, for myself, uh, I, I followed kind of the Tom Brady plan, apparently. Uh, he says he doesn't lift weights a lot. He stretches a lot. And that, that would describe my life. I, I don't lift weights a lot, uh, but I like stretching every day. And when I first started stretching, I'll tell you, it felt terrible. And uh, I, I remember it was like a couple weeks ago, one of my kids said, wow, dad, you can really stretch far. Because I've been stretching every day, sometimes multiple times a day, because it actually feels good now, believe it or not. Before, I, I just, I did not, so I see some of you guys stretching, you're distracting me. <laughs> Now's not the time. Um, <laughs> and this is what fervent love will do to you. It'll stretch your soul. It'll cause you to stretch to do things that you wouldn't have done before. And you have to follow the pattern. It's following Jesus, who is the example of fervent love, purifying your soul, and then finding out, now I can uh, stretch. You can do it if you want now. Just stretch out, right? And just, there you go. It feels good, right? Stretch, stretch out that love for others. It's, it reminds me of this fervent, this intense love, right? That's stretched out towards God and others. It reminds me of Luke 24 when the disciples had Jesus come along on the road to Emmaus. And then they're walking with the risen Lord. And they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? What are they saying? The driver's seat of my life, all my thoughts, emotions, feelings came alive when he was near. Does that describe your life? You're a Christian, a follower of Jesus. When you walk in the room, do people go, man, my heart just burns around that person because they're so full of life. They fervently love people around me. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? 
And each time he followed up with, yes, Lord. And then Jesus said, okay, then feed some people. Take care of some people. Tend to my people. What was Jesus saying? Hey, when you come to me, I want to purify your soul so that you can move out with fervent love. It's great. This, this whole thing that he set up for us, shouldn't, we shouldn't just sit idly by. We should engage it. We should go full force into this because it's, it's a good walk, this Christian life. Verse 23 through 25. Next point is, I am not strong enough. Verse 23, if you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living, enduring word of God. See, every one of us was born. We have an earthly dad who gave us what he had. Everything he had, he tried to give to us. What he didn't have, he couldn't give to us. But here it says, you were not born again with a perishable seed. The Christian life is all about being born again. You give your life to Jesus. There's this spiritual rebirth. I'm a new creation. And now you get everything from your heavenly father who gives you exactly, not what your dad didn't have, but gives you everything that you need. Let me say that another way. Earthly dad is limited. Heavenly dad is unlimited. Gives you everything that you need to walk through this life. God's word, it says in here, unlike, you know, as good as our dad was, he was limited. God's word is living. God's word is living and enduring. Uh, the other night, I, I was uh, going at the end of the day to uh, just visit in with my, one of my kids, and I found out I, I, I walked into a situation where they were kind of resolving something. And I asked, I asked them, hey, did you, did, you, uh, did you get that thing resolved? And they said, yeah, I already got right with my dad. And it struck me as funny. I'm like, uh, hello, <laughs> what? <laughs> That's me. I don't even know what you're talking about. And, then they thought, and it was so cool because they went, oh, I mean, no, I mean my other dad. I was like, that, that is so good. I love that. I love my kids born again, trusting in their heavenly father. So good. Verse 24, for all flesh is like grass in all its glory, like the flowers of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. So then I got another little fun fact. I love talking about stories about family. It's so good. I got another little fun fact. One of my other kids came up to me last week and said, Dad, did you know that your skin, by the time your cells get to the surface, it's actually all dead? I said, that's, that's the strangest thing I heard all day. Okay, where did you learn that, right? And then my next thought was, well, I don't know. It's looking pretty good on mom. That was, that was my thought. All flesh is like grass. It's glory, like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall off. The flesh fails. I'm not strong enough. Uh, yesterday in this very parking lot, we celebrated one of the strongest men in this church, Dave Warren. What a superstar of the faith. Uh, many people in this parking lot, if you knew him, you just, you know what I'm talking about. He's a strong man in the Lord. He loved well. And you could just hear it in the stories around, around the community yesterday. Uh, but as strong as he was, his flesh failed. He went to be with the Lord. His flesh tapped out and said, it's time. But verse 25 in our passage this morning, 1 Peter 1, 25, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. There was a passage that was highlighted in Dave's Bible. I'm not going to try to compete with that. You heard that. It sounded awesome. There was a passage that was highlighted in Dave's Bible in 1 Thessalonians 4. And I'm, I'm going to turn there, actually because I want to make sure I get, get exactly 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, so that you'll not grieve as those, uh, who, the rest of those who have no hope. 
For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. This was one of the passages that was highlighted in Dave's Bible. And I said, based on that, the bad news is that Dave, his past, his flesh wasn't strong enough. The good news is that Dave is coming back again. Praise God, right? And if you know anything about Dave, you know he's coming back with a smile, a cup of coffee, and a sarcastic comic comment loaded up for you. That's Dave. That's our brother Dave. He's amazing. I'm not strong enough, but the word of the Lord is. The word of God is. The word of God can carry us through this life on into the next one. And this is the word that was preached to you. Now, this is something, this is a line that not only we have to absorb for ourselves. Yes, this is the word that was preached to us. But this is something that we need to take very seriously as representatives of God. That we need to make a big deal and stretch this fervent love out to others so that we would share the gospel with other people around us. We have to do this. This is not option. This is not wait for the evangelist to stroll into town. No, this is you. If you have the hope of Christ inside of you and you step up to somebody who is far from God, the very nature, the fact that you just stepped near them means they're not very far from God because Christ, the hope of glory, lives inside of you. How can they be far from God when you're in the room? So we have to stretch We have to obey the truth, have our our soul purified so we're ready, we're sober-minded, ready in spirit, ready to go, ready to pull the trigger on this thing. Share fervently, in love, the gospel, this fiery message about Jesus with people that we come across. We have to do it. Introverts, I stand with you. (laughs) Extroverts, you have no excuse. We envy you. (laughs) We have to do this. We have to do this. I was telling the young ladies that are going to get baptized in a moment that it's pretty neat that this tub that we bought, the fact that they're getting baptized today, there's two people that had the gospel shared with them as a result at the store we bought it from. And one of the the two that we shared the gospel with said, you know, you're not the first person who's shared this with me. I said, well, maybe that should tell you that God's trying to get a hold of your heart. I said, and if what we're saying as Christians is true, that there's a gold mine in your backyard, why wouldn't you at least grab a shovel and go out there and do some digging and see if what we're saying is true? This is too good to hold on to ourselves. And not only is it so good for us, it would be really good news for them. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 15 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be what? Saved. Everyone. Everyone. How then can they call on the one who they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without somebody telling them? Anybody with me? Okay. How are they going to know if you don't go tell them? You might as well risk looking like a fool and tell your friend about Jesus. Uh, If he's good news to you, he should be good news to them. The alternative for their life, if they don't know Christ, is terrible news. And we don't want that for them. Let's recap a little bit. Your heart is leading your soul. That's why we need to obey the truth and purify our soul and get into this fervent love. I'm not strong enough. Third point. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Get... Jesus fit for the task. Okay, yes, there's CrossFit. This is like our Christian version, Jesus fit. Get Jesus fit for the task. What that's going to take is putting aside one thing so we can long for another. Check out verse 1 in chapter 2. Therefore, putting aside all malice 
deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Somebody's got to hear this this morning. Somebody's got to put aside some malice, evil intent. Somebody's got to put aside some deceit. Have you been deceived by the enemy? Are you deceiving others through lies? Somebody's got to put aside hypocrisy that's acting the part but having no intention to follow through. That's acting a Christian. But then when you get home, they don't see Jesus in you. That's hypocrisy. Somebody's got to put aside envy. Stop scrolling online and looking what everybody else has and feeling sorry for yourself. Start getting plugged into true north, following Jesus and saying, God, whether I have or whether you take away, blessed be the name of the Lord. I've got it all. I've struck gold. I found the gold mine. Somebody's got to put aside slander. We hold on to grudges. We hold on to unforgiveness. We hold on to that one comment, the one thing they did, and we hold on to it for years. And it eats us up and it taints the way we see that person. And so we start bad mouthing them. We start talking about, we start tainting their reputation around everybody else. Why? Because it makes us feel good. And we're deceiving ourselves. All these things. They fit together. We need to put them aside. We need to get Jesus fit for the task that he has for us. Put those things aside. Bring him to the cross. Say, Lord, forgive me. I turn from this. I've been, I've been talking bad about people. I've been deceiving myself. I've been living in hypocrisy. Put it aside. Turn from those things. You'll be so glad you did. You, you'll see your soul get that washing. You know, there's certain things now I've learned not to put down my household drain. Don't put a bunch of rice down your household drain. Don't put a bunch of hot pasta down your household drain. I can't help this one, but try not to put a bunch of hair down your household drain. I live with a lot of long-haired people. <laughs> certain things are going to clog, clog the pipes, and you either got to call a plumber or know how to get that stuff out of there. And it's the same thing with our soul. This list right here, you want to clog your soul real quick. You want to, you want to find out that, that going up doesn't mean going down. Don't fill, don't fill the system. Don't fill your engine with this stuff. Rid your soul. Rid your heart of all these sins. Give them up. You'll be surprised when you bring them to the cross and you just you keep putting them there, back over and over again. Daily repentance, coming after Jesus. And you'll find out that over time, I'm not the same person I used to be. Very different. I'm stretched. I've got fervent love for God and for people. Anything that's clogging my soul's ability to love fervently, I need to get rid of. There are times I take this thing and I, I just throw it across the room. I get off of that thing. I get off the phone. I turn off the TV. I distance myself from somebody I realize they're kind of toxic for me right now. Whatever you got to do, don't put that stuff in the system. Don't clog your engine, your soul with that stuff. Instead, verse 2 of chapter 2, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. In chapter 1, Peter actually said, as obedient children. He's actually taking us further into infancy. You see that? <laughs> From children now to like newborn babies long for this word. That's all babies can think about when they're awake. Right? Maybe some of you haven't been about babies for a while. I don't know, but that's all they can think about. I just want milk. And they cry for it. And that could be us for God's word. That could be us for things of the spirit. That could be us for worshiping him. That could be us for getting on mission with him. This could be us. This could be the church. This could be us. It's fully alive because they're unleashed towards God and we become like kids for this stuff. Man, I just want what my father has for me. So good. Little Chloe and Emma want that. We're going to just, we're going to, this place is going to light up today when they get baptized, right? We're going to go crazy for them because this is a big moment in their life. I want to read, I want to, I want to finish with a quote from G.K. Chesterton. 
You may not know him, but he's got some brilliant quotes. He says, children have abounding vitality because they are in spirit, fierce, and free. You could say they're fervent. Therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. Kids always say, do it again, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he's nearly dead. <laughs> For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. Ah, church service again. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of creating. It may be that he has the eternal appetite for childhood. For we have sinned and we have grown old and our father is younger than we. Such a good quote. Last verse in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we're going to read. It says, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. If you've tasted and seen how good God is, you will obey him at all costs. You'll see your soul get purified. And you'll see your heart unleashed to God. And you will fervently love God and people wholeheartedly. Amen. Let's pray. We'll sing another worship song and get ready for this baptism. Father God, we thank you for this word. It's good. It's even better if we take it into our, our hearts and let it just kind of simmer in there and, and tell our soul what to do with it. So God, let us live wholeheartedly. But Lord, let us unleash those hearts to you. And God, would you create in us clean hearts? Would you forgive us of all of our sins, Jesus? Would you baptize us in your waters, Lord God? Make us clean again so that we might follow you every day. God, thank you for making us free people. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. We want to live in such a way, God, but not settling for what the world has, definitely not entering in what the enemy has, but God entering into our Father's business. We love you and praise you and trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.